Edia here in Nashville, Tennessee. And we are glad that you are here today. For those of you who have traveled long distance to be, with, uh, to be with us here, we are happy that you made it safely. And for those of you who are going to be viewing us uh, uh, via live stream all over the world, we welcome you also to this special event, this special convocation on Warn the Cities. I want you to know that um, as, as we come together to hear the special messages that will be shared to us by Pastor Steve Wolberg, we're honored that that this time in history, that we are alive to be able to witness this and to have a major part in seeing God pour out his Holy Spirit in a mighty way. Let me just give you a, a little background about Pastor Steve Wahlberg. He is the speaker director of White Horse Media, well known on radio, television through his many books. By the way, you can learn more about his ministry through whitehorsemedia.com. He lives in Prince uh, River, Idaho with his wife, Christine, their children, Seth and Abby. Well, you know, the first time I met Pastor Steve Wahlberg was actually in 1983. 1983 at a camp meeting in Soquel, California. And uh, I just got out of uh, college at that time. And we were just starting our ministries. And it's exciting to know that God could, has poured out his spirit upon Pastor Steve, in a mighty way, that he has re reached thousands and millions around the world with his ministry. And I believe that God has a special message. But I need you to be praying for the special t presentations, not only this morning, but throughout the day. Will you do that for me? <laughs> and at this time, I'm going to invite you to pray as we invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Loving Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for allowing us to come here together for this special presentation on War in the Cities. Lord, I pray for a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Steve Wahlberg and the other participants. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be poured out upon our audience, our viewing audience also, that we can hear the message, clear our minds, empty us of ourselves so we can hear the words and be able to apply this in our lives and take action upon it. Thank you, dear Father, for allowing us to be here. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Pastor Steve Wahlberg, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Melvin. Appreciate that. Good morning. Good morning to you who are here and those who are watching. Uh, thank you for giving me a warm welcome. It's good to be in Nashville. When I say warm welcome, it's hot here. <laughs> I tell you, this is, uh, this is hotter than Priest River, Idaho. Hot and humid. Well, it's a, it's a blessing to be here, and I want to start on a rather light note. Uh, there's a picture of my family up there on the screen. Uh, my daughter, Abigail, and my wife, Kristen, uh, our son, Seth, and I just have to tell you that yesterday was my son's 12th birthday, and where was Dad? <laughs> Dad was here in Nashville, and uh, that's very rare that I miss his, his birthday. I don't think I've ever done that. But he told me something before I left that just uh, I wanted to share with you. He said, he said, Dad, it's all right if you're going to miss my birthday. And then he said, if God is telling you to do something, he said, you do it. Amen. And uh, that encouraged me, you know, hearing that from a little boy. And so anyway, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why I'm here, because I believe that God is telling me to do something. He's telling me to be here, and our hope for this uh, this day and all the presentations is that you also will hear the voice of God and that you will be impressed that God is telling you to do something and that you will do it. That's, uh, that's our hope and our desire. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 26. 26. And I'd like to read... Verse, the second half of verse 9. Actually, we'll read the whole verse. And then we'll pray again. I know Pastor Melvin has prayed. I like to pray before I speak. I don't think we can pray too much, can we? Isaiah chapter 26, verse 9. Isaiah wrote, With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you 
early. For when your what? When your judgments are in the earth. And that's our topic uh, for the first meeting this weekend. It's the coming judgments of God. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn. And what's that next word? Righteousness. Righteousness. All right, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity, this privilege to be here in Nashville, Tennessee. And Father, we pray in the name of Jesus for the Holy Spirit, again, to bless uh, all of the presentations and uh, those that are here and those that are watching. Lord, you know the hour in which we live and how important it is that we hear your voice today. Please speak through me. Bless us all. Talk to our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, today is July 23rd, uh, 2016. We're here in Nashville, Tennessee for the first meeting of what we're calling Warn the Cities Convocation. That's what this event is called. Uh, it is being streamed live on the website, warnthecities.com. That's our new website. Uh, I am well aware of the fact that today, July 23rd, is an event that is sandwiched in between two big political conventions. I'm sure you're aware of that. Uh, on, the, on the behind side of us, just this past week, was, was the Republican National Convention that took place in Ohio. I don't know if any of you watched any of these speeches. Quite an emotional week they had in Ohio. This coming week, the Democrats will have their convention in Pennsylvania. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, emotions there as well. People around the country and around the world uh, are watching both of these conventions. And here we are in the middle. And it's my conviction, if I may be so bold as to say this, it is my conviction that what is happening today in this convention or this uh, convocation, from God's perspective, uh, I believe is more important than both of the conventions Amen. that the world is watching. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. Here's why I say that. Whoever is elected in November, whoever gets into the White House, whether it's uh, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, Republicans or Democrats, whoever gets in, the fact is that no earthly president can really and truly and permanently solve the problems of America or the problems of this world. It's just not possible. It's just not possible, no matter how skilled they may be. Only the ruler of the universe can solve the problems of this world. And, he, and I, do, I refer to him as ruler, not president, because uh, God is not, his office is not open uh, for election. God is, a, is, a, is an absolute and loving ruler of his universe. And his plan is to get rid of sin to get rid of it entirely, to completely wipe it out from not only uh, this planet, but from his universe entirely. That is his plan, and I want to make it very clear that God's plan is motivated by his love, his intense love for his universe and for you and for me. Unfortunately, Part of that plan, and there's just no way around this. Uh, it's, uh, sometimes I tell audiences I've got good news and bad news. And the bad news is it's going to get worse before it gets better. Unfortunately, that's just the case. There's no way around that. But the good news is that when it gets good, it's going to get really good. <laughs> it's going to get better than we can possibly imagine. And part of God's plan in getting rid of evil has to do with his judgments, the coming judgments of God. 
and that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to focus on our Bibles. We're going to see what the Bible has to say, what God has to say, and our hope and our prayer for this event today is that uh, we're just praying that this will not just be a blessing to you here, but that it will spark a revival among us and among those who are watching, that it will spark a movement, hopefully a global movement, for us to do our part, for all of us and many more, to do our part to warn others what is coming, to warn them in love and compassion, with grace on our lips, but to warn them about what is coming with the ultimate goal in mind that they will be ready for the return of the King of Kings. Amen. That's what this is all about. We need to get ready for the King. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 9. 26, 9. I read this verse a little bit ago, the second half of the verse. verse says, When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Uh, this verse has impressed me deeply. If you've been watching the news at all, you uh, must be aware of the fact that there are, there's just disaster after disaster after disaster that is hitting this planet right now. It's amazing. Isaiah 26 verse 9 talks about the judgments of God. And the question is, are these disasters, do they have anything to do with God's judgments? Well, and we just see them all around us. Uh, terrible earthquakes. There's a picture of, of a big earthquake in Japan or, or a news report. And these just, go, these just go on and on. These are just uh, quick snapshots of terrible things that are happening on this planet. Devastating floods are going on, uh, not just in America, but around the world. They're happening in ways that we can hardly imagine. Tornadoes ripping through the Midwest uh, and other places. They just, they just keep coming. Killer hurricanes, storms, typhoons, tsunamis, destructive fires like in California and Canada and other places around the world. Hail storms. Uh, here's a picture of a hailstorm that took place in Siberia. And here were people on the beach and the hail was so big that it was very, very dangerous. And of course we know about terrorism, uh, savage terrorism. Uh, I just read a report today that another terrorist attack took place in Afghanistan just today. Yesterday, where was it? Germany. It was in Germany, that's right, just yesterday. Uh, it wasn't long ago until when Istanbul, the airport, got hit. We think of Orlando, we think of San Bernardino. Uh, France has been hit a number of times, and it just seems like, you know, you can hardly turn on the news these days. Uh, my wife says it's depressing. She doesn't even want to watch the news because there's something happening, some new catastrophe, some new disaster, some new terrorist attack. Uh, this is the world that we live in. It's a reality to life on planet Earth. There's no way around it. These are, these are facts. Now again, the question is, uh, based on Isaiah 26, verse 9, when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. The question should be asked, are these calamities, even terrorism, does this have anything to do with the judgments of God described in the Bible? My conviction is the only way to answer that question, to intelligently and correctly answer that question is to go to the book, to go to the book of books. Amen. You're not here just to hear my opinion. My opinion really isn't worth much. Uh, it's, it's the Bible. It's God's holy word. What does, what does the ruler of the universe have to say about what is going on on his planet? Well, I'm, conv I'm convicted from all my study of the Bible that, first of all, the only way for us to correctly and intelligently answer the question about the judgments of God is to take a close look at his character. What is he like? What is the character of the ruler of the universe? Uh, I'll just put a text here on the screen, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. Oh, and there's a picture. I'll tell you about that in a second. 
Uh, that verse, 1 John 4, 8, says God is love. God is love. I believe that. Do you? Yeah. Now there's a face. Oh, look at that face. That's a happy face. That is my daughter, Abigail Rose Wahlberg. I thought I'd put that picture up there because I, I think it makes a point. You know, uh, how can you look at that face and come to the conclusion that this little girl evolved from a snail or from a monkey? You know, it's just, it's just not, it's not true. It's not really what the Bible says. God is a God of love. And if you look at the faces of children, and there's a lot of uh, happy children in this church as well. If you look at the faces of, of children, whatever the color of our skin, whether it's white or black or brown or red or yellow, uh, you look at the happy faces of little children and it just speaks to us loudly that there is a God in heaven. There is a God of love who made us in his image. That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm, I'm not going to take time to read the whole section right now because we're on the clock and I've got a lot to cover. But if you look up sometime Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 to 8, those verses are a revelation from God himself to Moses and to the world about what he's like, what his heart is like what his character is like, what are the attributes that he, that he reveals. And when you read those verses, it's very, very clear, and there's probably thousands of verses in the Bible that talk about the mercy of God, that God is a very merciful God, that he is kind, he is forgiving. Uh, it's just all over the place. Scripture after scripture, if you had a scale and you think about the character of God, his character is heavy on the mercy side. And aren't you glad? If it wasn't, we wouldn't be here. We would all be dead. Uh, somebody once said, we often complain that we don't get what we want, but we should all be very thankful that none of us has yet received what we deserve. <laughs> and the reason is because God is merciful. And that's what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 34. Uh, mercy, compassion, kindness. Now, as you keep, re keep reading that passage, it also says that he's abundant in goodness and truth, that God is not just kind and compassionate, but he's a God of truth. Truth is important to him. His nature is truth. The Holy Spirit, the New Testament says, is the spirit of truth. The Bible says God is the God of truth, and he's also holy. He's a holy God. He says, be holy for I am holy. Now, as you keep reading Exodus 34, as it goes down in the list, it also tells us that God is also a God of justice. It says that plainly, that he, he visits. Uh, in other words, he punishes, he punishes sin. God is a God of justice. And, uh, and I, I'm learning to appreciate that more and more as I have children. You know, I would certainly want anything that threatens the life of my kids to disappear. Wouldn't you? Those of you that are parents. God is full of mercy, kindness, truth, holiness, and justice. The Bible tells us that, and here's a big point, that when mercy and kindness and truth and holiness are rejected by human beings, when they are persistently rejected, consistently, adamantly, with a high hand, rejected, boldly, incorrigibly, that there comes a time when a line is crossed. There comes a time when a line is crossed. And I'll, I'll read to you a statement from a famous poem called The Doomed Man, written by a Presbyterian minister in the 1800s. He says, there is a time we know not when, a point we know not where, that marks the destiny of men to glory or despair. There is a line by us unseen that crosses every path 
the hidden boundary between God's patience and his wrath. There is a line, and eventually when that line is crossed, judgments fall. Justice, justice kicks in. The biggest crisis that we are experiencing on planet Earth today is not the global economy, as big of an issue as that is. It is not immigration. That's not our biggest crisis, as important as that is. It's not the inequality between the rich and the poor, as important as that issue is. The biggest issue facing planet Earth right now is, and don't miss this, it is the issue of morality. It is morality. And it is because of gross, persistent immorality that God sends his judgments, that God sends his justice into this world. And we need to understand that, understand that very, very clearly. Uh, as I mentioned, God is merciful. He's very merciful. And even his judgments, most of the time, are opportunities. They are opportunities for people to learn about his righteousness. Look back at the text. Isaiah 26, verse 9. When your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will what? They will learn. Do you see that? They will, let me put that verse back on the screen. They will learn righteousness. There it is right there. Learning righteousness. So judgments and learning righteousness are in the same verse. Same verse. Now this has impressed me very, very deeply. Uh, here's a picture that I saw the picture's on the screen. I saw this just a few weeks ago. Uh, that's a picture of Los Angeles, where I grew up. And there you can see off in the distance, this is from the perspective of Century City, downtown LA. You can see this gigantic column of smoke. See that? It's because of the fires that have been burning around Los Angeles, Kern County, and other places, San Bernardino, different different spots, and uh, just to, it, for, for a long time, I have wrestled with sending my relatives, who uh, none of which are members of my church, but I love them a lot. <laughs> my mom, my dad, my stepmother, my brother, my sister, many of them are in the LA area, and I've been uh, wrestling with sending them a personal letter from me to them with information about what's happening in the world. But I've been putting that off for a while until I saw this picture. When I saw that picture and the fires burning right outside of Los Angeles, that brought me over the line just about a month ago. And I thought, Lord, I need to do something right now. And so I sent 14 of my relatives a letter, a personal letter from me to them. And I included in that letter, in the envelope, a track or a flyer that Whitehorse Media has recently put out called The Coming Judgments of God. They go right through the Bible, talk about what's happening in the world. I wrote them a letter and I encouraged them, please, to read this flyer. Read this flyer. Well, uh, I'm happy to say that I received a text from one of my relatives. Where is it? I had it up here and it's okay. One of my relatives uh, sent me a text, and I was so happy to read this. She said, uh, Steve, I have read and reread the coming judgments of God. I want to share it with other people, especially if they don't know the Lord. God is, uh, is using you. Praise the Lord. Love and blessings. And then they sign their name. And when I got that, that text, I thought, thank you, God. And it just, uh, it, it impressed me, again, with the Bible verse that you see on the screen, that because of the things that are happening right now, people are looking at things, they're looking at these things, and they are open. Many are open, not everybody, but many are. 
And according to God's word, when his judgments are in the earth, this is an opportunity for us to talk to people about his character, about his love, about his mercy, about his truth, and about his justice. And people are open, many of them, to learn righteousness. And that's why we want this, uh, this event here to be a motivator to move people to be involved in sharing and talking and warning people about what is coming, warning people. Now, when the Bible says righteousness, it says learn righteousness. You can do a lot of study in Scripture on that word righteousness. Uh, here's a picture. This is another happy picture. It's about, it shows the Ten Commandments. Some time ago, I was in Dallas, and I, uh, my flight was canceled, and the airline put me up in a hotel, gave me a, a voucher, what do they call it, a, a distressed traveler rate. <laughs> they gave me a distressed traveler rate, and a shuttle took me to the, uh, to the hotel, and as the shuttle was going down the highway, uh, I could see the, water, the flood waters were, were rising right in the Fort Worth, Dallas area where I used to live, and if they kept on coming because of all the rain, they would eventually gone right over the freeway. And I'm looking at all this, and then the shuttle driver drops me off at the hotel, that they had given me this, uh, this voucher for, and as I walked toward the door, I was very pleased to see a big monument of the Ten Commandments. There they are. In fact, I brought a couple tables here with me. Ten Commandments. This is God's law. This is what God wrote with his own finger on stone. There's, there's a lot of laws in this world, and there have been throughout history, but there's only one law that's ever been written with the finger of God Amen. on two tables of stone, and that's the Ten Commandments. And stone shows that this law cannot change. It can never change. It's, it's permanent. It's permanent forever, written with the finger of God. And so when I saw those Ten Commandments, I thought, great, this is a nice hotel for me to stay in. And as I walked in... Uh, I saw this, and then I, I, I grabbed a security guard, <laughs> and I said, hey, let's take a picture. Would you mind? And so uh, the shuttle driver took a picture of the two of us, and then I handed him a glow track. I said, here's a, here's a little glow track to help you to learn more about the Ten Commandments. Romans chapter 8, verse 4, Romans chapter 9, verse 30 and 31 are very clear that righteousness has to do with the law of God. Righteousness means what's right, in contrast to what's wrong, what is right and what is wrong. And God's law is a righteous law. God is to be first in our lives. We're not to have any idols. We're not to take his name in vain. We're to keep the Sabbath holy. We're to honor our parents. We're not to murder. We're not to commit adultery or steal or lie or covet. And God's law is summarized in two great principles of love, love to God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. That is God's righteous principle, principles of love, his righteous law. And the Bible also tells us, 1 John 3, 4, Romans 3, 20, that the definition of sin, of sin, and sin is what's caused all the problems in this, in this world that the biblical definition of sin is that sin is breaking God's law. It's a sin to have other gods before God. It's a sin to have idols. It's a sin to take his name in vain. It's a sin to break the Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath. It's a sin not to honor our parents or to murder or hate or uh, be involved in any form of sexual immorality or to steal or lie or covet. It's a sin not to love not to love God, our creator, who made us and put us here, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, whatever the color of our skin. The Bible is very clear on this. And God's judgments are opportunities for us to teach people these principles, to teach them what's right and what's wrong. Now, not only that, but there's a verse that I really like in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. I'll just quote it. It's an ancient prophecy about Jesus and it refers to Jesus Christ as the Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verse 6, that Jesus 
is our righteousness. And the incredible news of the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, is that God is not just a God of love, but he so loved the world that he gave his own son. His own son. I have a son. He just turned 12 yesterday. God gave his own son. He gave him to live for us. To live a life of righteousness for us. To keep the Ten Commandments for us. To suffer in the Garden of Gethsemane for us. And eventually and ultimately to stretch out his arms and to die on a cross for us. For you and for me and for the whole world. Jesus died for us all. And when the Bible says that people need to learn righteousness, <clears throat> the heart of righteousness is that Jesus is our righteousness and that he paid the price. He paid the price. He paid the, he paid the full price on the cross for every single sin that we've ever committed of breaking his holy law. The character of God is a character of love and mercy and forgiveness and compassion and truth and justice. Justice as well. And the cross is the center of God's plan. It's the center of his plan to get rid of sin, to get rid of it entirely. He paid for sin. He paid the price for our sins. Put it that way. He paid the price for our sins and one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to get rid of sin. Entirely, completely, totally from his universe. And the cross is at the center of God's plan. Now, back to the Bible. Isaiah 26, verse 10. You see verse 9 on the screen. Verse 10 says, let grace be shown to the wicked. I'm reading from the New King James Bible. Let grace be shown to the wicked. God has been showing grace ever since Adam and Eve sinned. He's been showing grace for thousands of years. That grace is centered in the cross. God has been showing grace and love and forgiveness and mercy for a long time. Let grace be shown to the wicked. Yet the next part says, yet... He will not learn righteousness. Now here's my point. If God shows grace to the wicked and kindness to the wicked and offers them forgiveness for a long, long time so that they will learn righteousness, but if the wicked continue to choose that they will not learn. See that? If they settle in incorrigibly, that they will not change. If they will not learn, then God sends judgments. If they won't learn from grace, hopefully they will learn from judgments. And the judgments are designed to wake people up, to realize the seriousness of sin, and that sin leads to death. It leads to doom. It leads to destruction. And God does not want people to be destroyed. He wants us to be saved. Isaiah, go back in, in Isaiah and turn back to a couple, couple chapters to chapter 13. This verse has impressed me very strongly. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 11. And I'll put that text on the screen as well. I've pondered this verse. Isaiah 13, 11, the first part of the verse, there it is on the screen. God says, I will do what? I will punish the world for its evil. Isaiah 13, 11. This is the voice of God Almighty. Right there. Now, let me draw your attention to a few facts. First of all, who is it that is doing the punishing based on this text? 
The answer is, it's God. God himself. God is the ruler of the universe. He's a moral governor. And there comes a time when God himself punishes sin. Now, why, why is he doing this, based on the text? Does that mean that God's bad? Is it a, is it a bad God punishing? Some people think so. I don't think so. I know that's not the case. What does the verse say? Why does God himself punish the world? Why? What does the text say? It says he punishes the world for its evil. So who's evil? Is it God or the world? That's right. It's the world. It's a good God punishing a bad world. That's what the Bible's telling us. And it also says, as you keep reading this verse, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their what? For their iniquity, right? The word iniquity has to do with breaking his law, breaking his holy law his good law, his law of truth and righteousness about not lying and killing and stealing and honoring parents, which is for the good of all. God says he will punish the wicked for their iniquity. From God's perspective, and I know this is a straight, straight truth, from God's perspective, breaking his law is wicked. It's wicked. It's bad. It's evil. And the Bible tells us he is going to punish the world for breaking his commandments. Now, next question. How does he punish? How does he do this? Well, in order to answer that, we again have to go to the Bible. The Bible is clear that most of the time, times God uses agencies he has many options available to him. And he uses instruments. He uses agencies of his, his justice. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. The classic example of that is the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Bible says that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, only evil all the time. God looked down and he saw a, a wicked world. Verse 6 says he was sorry. He looked at all of this. He wanted to see happy faces, happy children, loving homes, people doing what's right, and all he saw was wrong and evil, and wickedness, and violence, and corruption. And he got to the point where he said to himself, I'm sorry, I even made man. I never should have made him in the first place. What a disaster. Verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. God said, enough is enough. And how did he do that? In verse 17, verse 17 says, And behold, I myself, I myself am bringing floodwaters upon the earth. And we don't have time to read the whole story, but you know the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. God gave them 120 years. But eventually, the last day came. Those that got in the boat got in, and those that didn't, didn't. The saved were on the inside, the lost were on the outside, and eventually the rain and the water and the flood came down. And God said, I'm doing this. I myself am bringing floodwaters upon the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So God himself did it. Let's be very clear about that. But God used the agency of rain. 
He used water. He used the flood. What about the time of Sodom? We fast forward to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis, we don't have time to read the whole section, but the Bible's very clear that Sodom and Gomorrah were wicked cities. Their evil was great before God. Great before God. What was going on in Sodom? The Bible tells us in Jude, verse 7, the book right before the book of Revelation, the Bible tells us that Sodom, among other things, they had a lot of problems, but one of their big sins was that they gave themselves over to sexual immorality. It says in Jude 7 that they went after strange flesh. Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 clarifies. And you can read Genesis 19, you see it right there. Romans 1, 26 and 27 says that, that men burned in their lust one for another. And women did the same thing. Women with women, men with men. It's right there in the Bible. Romans 1, Jude 7, Genesis 19. And eventually, a line was crossed. A line was crossed. And Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, tells us what happened. I'll read the text. And you can look at the Bible and look on the screen. The Bible says, Then the Lord... So who did this? It was the Lord. He rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. From the Lord out of the heavens. That's what it says. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. It's very clear that God did it. But he used the agency of fire. He used rain and he used fire. Look at Psalm 148, verse 8. Psalm 148, this is an amazing verse. I found this verse once in my morning reading of the Bible and it just jumped out at me. And I thought, I've got to use this verse when I speak on this subject. Psalm 148, verse 8. Says, fire, that was an agency, an instrument, and hail, and snow, and clouds, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. And this tells us that God can use all of the agencies of nature if he sees fit to implement his justice. He can do it. Now, I want to show you a quotation on the screen, and I will talk more about this author, the author of this quotation this afternoon. But here is a quotation. Here you see a picture on the screen of all kinds of uh, tornadoes, fires, floods, hurricanes. It says here, calamities are becoming more and more frequent. Is that true? Yeah. It is. And each report of calamity by land or sea is a testimony to the fact that the end of all things is near. The world is filled with iniquity and the Lord is punishing it for its wickedness. The Lord is punishing the world for its wickedness through calamities. He did it in the days of Noah. He did it in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's done it over and over and over again throughout Bible history. As crimes and iniquities increase, these judgments will become more frequent until the time shall come when the earth shall no more cover her slain, which is a quote from Isaiah chapter 26. So calamities are agencies of God's judgments in the earth so that people will learn righteousness. That statement is very clear. Now, here's a big question. What about terrorism? What about terrorists? Can God allow or 
work through or in some mysterious way can even wicked, savage, brutal terrorists, can they be part of his judgments as well? Now, I know that's a, that's a very controversial question, but let me present some Bible facts for your consideration. I have been pondering this topic, thinking about it, because, like I said, uh, today Afghanistan got hit. Yesterday it was Germany. Last week it was France. And these, these things just keep happening. Well, let me share with you a Bible verse in the book of Jeremiah. We're not going to read all these verses, but Jeremiah chapter 1. Turn to Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah 1, verses 14 to 16. Jeremiah was the last prophet of Judah. Israel was living in sin in Old Testament times. They had their idols. They were breaking God's commandments on all sides. The Babylonians were at the door. Cruel Babylonians. Savage Babylonians. And Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 14 says, Then the Lord said to me, Jeremiah said, The Lord said to me, Out of the north calamity shall spring forth on all the inhabitants of the land. And behold, I am calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord, and they will come. And each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem, against its walls around it, and against all the cities of Judah. And I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Wow. This text tells us that God was going to work through the cruel Babylonians to execute his judgments against Israel because of her sins. Now that's a, a tough truth, but it's there in the Bible. We don't have time to read, but you read chapter, when you read chapter 6, 19, and 22 to 25, it talks about how cruel the Babylonians were. And uh, don't forget that God also judged those Babylonians as well for their acts of savagery. They didn't get away with it without coming themselves under the justice and the judgments of God. But that's what happened. Now, earlier, prior to this, the ancient Assyrians were an instrument of God's judgment. Here's a, a map here, Samaria, Jerusalem. Here were the Assyrians, and the Babylonians were over here. The Assyrians came down, and they destroyed Samaria, and they were very, very cruel. They were one of the cruelest peoples uh, in history. In the book... Prophets and Kings, page 291, it says here that the destruction that befell the northern kingdom was a direct judgment from heaven. The Assyrians were merely the instruments that God used to carry out his purpose. Through Isaiah, who began to prophesy shortly before the fall of Samaria, the Lord referred to the Assyrian hosts as the rod of mine anger. The, the staff in their hand, he said, is my indignation. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 5. So it's very clear that the Assyrians were an agent of God's justice against the wicked northern kingdoms. What about the Babylonians? Same thing. We read that in Jeremiah. Here it says, back to Prophets and Kings, page 422, 428, and 429, that Babylon was to be used as the instrument of God's wrath upon impenitent Judah. As an interpreter of the meaning of the judgments beginning to fall upon Judah, Jeremiah stood nobly in defense of the justice of God and his merciful designs even in the severest chastisements. The prophet made plain the fact that our Heavenly Father allows his judgments to fall that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Psalm 920. If you walk contrary to me, the Lord says, and will not hearken to me, the Lord had forewarned his people, I, even I, will scatter you among the heathen and will draw at a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Quoting Leviticus 26, 21, 28, and 33. So, my, I mean, that is very, very plain that God allowed the Babylonians to do what they did and that these were his judgments. 
And Jeremiah, the last prophet of Judah, defended the justice of God in what was happening. He was the interpreter of what was going on. And he said to Israel, this is God's justice. This is God's judgments against, against a people that were doing a lot of bad things. And unfortunately, and this is part of the messiness of sin, unfortunately, so often the innocent suffer with the guilty. I'm sure there were a lot of innocent children that were in Jerusalem when the Babylonians came. Same in Samaria. Same with the flood. Don't you think there were some kids out there, some little kids that didn't know really about Noah and his preaching? And they went down too. Same in Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't help but think that there were some little kids in Sodom and Gomorrah when the fire fell that didn't know what was going on. It's part of the messiness of sin that these things happen. Now, what about the future? Here's another quotation. It says here, here's a, a picture of natural disasters and terrorists. It says, look at this. This is Review and Herald, November 28, 1882, and I'll talk more about this author this afternoon. The sword of wrath is stretched out over a people who have by their pride and wickedness provoked the displeasure of a just God. God is a just God. Now look at this. Storms, earthquakes, whirlwinds, fire, and the sword will spread desolation everywhere until men's hearts shall fail them for fear, looking for those things which are coming upon the earth. Quoting Luke chapter 21, verse 26. So that tells us through natural agencies and through the sword, justice, judgments are coming upon the planet. A few more quotes. I can see my time is running out fast. Now look at this. This is from the book Last Day Events. Page 95, it says, The Lord calls for his people to locate away from the cities, for in such an hour as you think not, fire and brimstone will be rained from heaven upon these cities. Proportionate to their sins will be their visitation. Jesus Christ said, as it was in the days of Lot, it's going to be the same thing. And this statement says that just like fire came down from heaven, and consume Sodom and Gomorrah, we can expect that fire is going to come down from the sky and consume wicked cities in the future. Wow, we're going to talk more about that this afternoon. This afternoon. Uh, here's another statement from Evangelism, page 29. The time is near when large cities will be swept away. And all should be warned of these coming judgments. People need to be warned about what's coming. They need to be warned of these judgments. That's what this weekend is all about. That's what this day is about. Warn the cities. Warnthecities.com. People need to be warned. Uh, I'll tell you more about this this afternoon, and you're, you're going to get one in a little while, those of you that are here, but I've written a book called The Coming Judgments of God, and the, the Bible information that I'm sharing with you is in this book. It's all based on the Bible, this book, and it's designed for sharing, to give to people, to help them to know what is coming so we can do our part. Uh, Revelation chapter 16 is very, very clear. When you read Revelation 16, very clear, it talks about the seven last plagues that are coming upon the earth. Very clear. And these are judgments directly from God himself. There's no doubt about it. Chapter, the whole chapter 16 and verse 7, look at this verse. It's on the screen. Revelation 16 verse 7 says, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. God's judgments are true and righteous. He's working the best he can with what he's got to work with in this world to wake people up. He allows, he sends he pleads, he works with all these crazy elements to try to wake people up and to realize what's coming and what's happen happening. Last, last section here, God's final revival. We've mentioned revival earlier 
at the beginning of this, uh, this meeting that this is a time of revival. This is a time of revival. Revelation chapter 18 talks about revival. Now here's a quote from the book, The Great Controversy, and I'll talk about this more this afternoon. The Great Controversy, page 464, says, look at this, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. God is going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon his people, and there's going to be a revival. And if you look closely at that quote, it tells us that that revival is connected to the awareness of God's judgments. It says before the final judgments fall, there's going to be a revival. You see that? So revival is connected to God's judgments. I don't have time to read it right now because my time's about gone. But uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, we'll read this this afternoon. The first verse is about God's light lightening the earth. That's revival. And then the whole rest of the chapter is about God's judgments falling upon Babylon. Revelation 18 connects revival with judgment. They go right together, right together. And I'm convicted, I'm so convicted of this, that at the heart of God's revival, it has to be this way. At the heart of the final revival is the message of Jesus Christ, what he did in Gethsemane and on the cross. It's got to be at the middle of it. Now here's an amazing truth. Don't ever forget this. Don't ever forget this. On the cross, and those of us that are saved, we'll never forget it when we get to heaven, when we all get there. What Jesus did on the cross was he experienced himself the full justice of God against all sin. Amen. He took the judgments. He took the justice. He drank the cup. He endured holy vengeance against sin. He endured it all. It was part of the plan that the Father and the Son had put together in eternity. It was the plan so that Jesus could pay the price for our sins and the justice would fall on him so he could then give us his mercy and his grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. That's it, I tell you. And that's what it's all about. And when it's all over, oh, you know, I just, I just, I, I know my time is up, but I'll give one quick illustration. Uh, you remember the terrorist attack in Istanbul? This, these people were killing people. There was a security guard that, ran, that saw what was happening, and he ran toward the main terrorist, and he only had a gun. The other guy was totally loaded, and he only had a gun, and he ran at that guy, and he shot him, and he took him out. He took him down, and then he saw the guy had a, a vest full of explosives, and so he jumped out of the way before the explosives went off, and he, he survived. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ on the cross, he took the devil down. He took him down. He faced him head on, and he took the sin, he took the explosives, he took the judgments, he took the justice, and he paid the price. Hallelujah. He's our hero. Praise the Lord, Jesus Christ. He's the hero, and he's going to come back. And when he comes back, here's my last slide. <laughs> and when he gets rid of evil because of love, he gets rid of sin, then the, then the whole universe is going to be clean. And boys and girls will play without fear. And they'll be happy people with God in a new heaven and a new earth forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the time is at hand. Your judgments are in the land. Help us to understand what you are doing. Help us to turn from our sins. Help us to see the beauty of Jesus Christ. Help us to be part of your work to warn people of what's coming because of love and to get ready 
for the return of the King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The sky shall unfold, preparing. Can't hear the music. Sorry about that. I wasn't here in the beginning, so. The sky shall
Amen. Amen. We shall behold him. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be transitioning to our worship service uh, after our presentation here. I'm going to invite you to do two things. Number one, would you please uh, move a little bit closer because we're going to be really packed this morning service so if you could just sit towards the uh, move towards the middle and don't breathe okay just you know take your last breath now and hold it after the service we're going to be really packed we want to be nice and tight here we have extra chairs on the side here but we really can't we just probably have to set it aside here because uh, we don't want to to violate the uh, fire marshal's ruling here. So please.